What was it about the the property of Ollivan Burns novel that attracted you to to this as being potential fodder for theater music for opera? The characters uh, which are wonderfully drawn, very vivid, um, larger than life in their way. Uh, also the situation, the basic dramatic premise, as we know of, of the book in which uh, a, a very crusty uh, individualist decides to flout, I don't say he decides, he just does it, uh, public opinion and, uh, and the town he lives in by remarrying three weeks after his first wife dies and to a woman half his age. Uh, that's already wonderful fodder. I mean, that's, that's your n nut, in a sense, that you, from which everything else derives. Uh, and the fact that I thought, thought it was a beautiful study of a relationship evolving between two people who's, who have absolutely no idea or don't envision the relationship going the way it goes, which is fascinating in itself because it's also profoundly human. By the time this one cropped up, I had directed like half a dozen operas in various parts of the world. And I think uh, the composer, Carlo Floyd, got in touch with me. I don't quite remember why now, but he, then he sent me the libretto and I was making a film in New Orleans. And I liked the libretto very much and I loved his music because I'd, I'd seen two or three of his other operas and um, regarded him as a really major composer. And I was thrilled to be offered the chance to work with him. He's very original. You can't listen to his music and thinking, well, it sounds like Verdi or Puccini. You don't do that. It sounds like Carlisle Floyd. In films, you have cuts. You keep cutting and varying the angles to make dramatic impact. But in opera, this dramatic impacts in a very different way because it's done with groupings and lighting. And everyone is seeing exactly the same image the whole way. So you can't rely on editing to do anything. But of course, you know, you have the power of the music, which is tremendously emotional. And you still have drama, you know, you still have character conflict, the same as you do in movies. So I don't direct the singers very differently to the way I direct film actors. When you're trying on the new hat, oh, Miss Love, you're just an artist. An artist. Um, it was very nice. Yeah, I, I bring it out a little bit more. Okay. You know, it doesn't have to be 180 degrees, but it's a little bit more, so we'll see your face and we'll see how good you look in the hat. The assistant director, Garnet Bruce, is an accomplished director himself, and he was with me when we did the original production, and then so he knows exactly how it was done, and he keeps meticulous notes, and then he can, in theory, just go and restage it anywhere, and it'll be exactly the same. Of course, there's always a slight variation. She's piqued your interest by the quality of the goods that she has selected for you all. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. Any questions? I thought this went, went very nice. Went very nicely. So, I, I, I love... The I'm listed as stage director for the production because I uh, had assisted Bruce in Houston and when he was not available to come here because of his film schedule, I uh, was already planning to be here to assist the remount and I just took on the added duties of s overseeing the remount. My job is to tell the story uh, as Bruce would have told it. Uh, in the rehearsal process, we decided certain approaches and certain ideas and a certain sequence of, not steps, it's not choreography, but okay, we'll, you know, for Pat, Re Pat Reset in one scene, we're gonna start off angry and then we're gonna be sad and then, you know, take us through a level of emotions.
there's a little bit of leeway um, in terms of creativity. I mean, it's, it's live theater, and you want it to be as immediate for a San Diego audience as it was the first time we did it. He's married to me. Good. Um, I like the move back to the chair. Just to keep it interactive enough so. And the way that you handled asked that I return your ring, I've never heard you sing it that way before. That's well, great. Yeah. Uh, you sort of, you, the ask that was colored by the phrase that was coming. Okay. It was more ask I'm that. Again, okay. I'm <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice, actually. Operas in English are more demanding because we tend to be careless. Um, even as I talk to you now, I'm being very considerate of my consonants. Uh, and the accent is also really important um, in this piece. It's not Tidewater, Georgia, which is sort of down near Charleston in the low country. Um, it's the sort of Piedmont area dialect. And it's you know, not the mountains of Appalachia that are in Susanna. And just trying to get that cadence with the language. Um, Carlisle came in. Uh, at the first rehearsal and just said, it's a little too fast, they haven't spent enough time in the South <laughs> about some of the speeches. And he said, you know, these people are used to singing this now and they're just gonna, you know, deliver it at their energy and they have to understand what a Southern energy is about. And it has a slow and has a weighted quality to its language and um, try and make sure that that is on stage here in San Diego. San Diego has been very fortunate in reuniting the three principal characters, Rucker Lattimore, Love Simpson, Will Tweedy, in the presence of Dean Peterson, Patricia Rosset, and John McFay. And there was a chemistry that developed over the four weeks of rehearsal in Houston uh, that we have actually jumped in on mid-process here in San Diego and are able to continue those conversations. Uh, it's been nice to improve on some things that uh, we didn't quite finish or we're still struggling to understand the first time around because now we feel we're closer to it or we're more in control of how we present it. And uh, joining that dialogue again a year later, I mean, that's something I hope we can do all the time with this piece. Two years later, five years later, uh, because the characters are so rich, because they are drawn from a three-dimensional look at real life. I'm, saying, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that there's something more I can find out of this moment between Will and I. Mm -hmm. And I think it happens before the moment happens, because it's too abrupt for me now. Mm -hmm. well, I, don't know, I don't know you're going to do that until. Yeah. Or I can, you know, I can look at where I'm at right now. Don't start nagging him again or I'll make you eat fish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Creating characters in opera is quite tricky. I mean, it's easy to say they shouldn't do those exaggerated gestures which have become, you know, so much a joke, they're a staple of cartoons. But you can see why singers fall into them, really, because they've got so many things to keep in mind. Because at the same time they're acting, they're singing and they have to hit certain notes, which is pretty difficult. And they have to keep their eye on the conductor all the time so they don't miss the, the beat. They have to be exactly in tune and they have to hit certain spots on the stage. It's a lot to keep in mind. And they're counting, and then they're trying to play, take a, be performers in an emotional drama. It's very, very tricky. It adds elements that, say, a film actor doesn't have. But it's wonderful the way, to me, especially in this production, they're really very good, the way they overcome so many of these, and it appears to be very natural. And I think, too, that younger American singers have grown up more in a tradition of naturalistic acting and they don't they don't really like all that sort of florid stuff they want it to be believable and accessible so they work very hard at it
becoming a bit old-fashioned to, you know, I always call it carrying in the wood gestures, you know, the, ah, you know, <laughs> this means nothing. You know, you wouldn't see this on, on, on film, maybe unless they were making fun of opera singers. <laughs> but other than that, you wouldn't see that. So uh, it was a, a thrill to work with Bruce. I mean, he's so easy to work with, but he was also, he's just very keen attention to detail. It wasn't about, you need to go there, you need to go there. It was about the inner landscape, the emotional line of the character, which is always more fascinating. She's very interesting. She's a very independent person, um, especially for this time. She's someone that is completely self-reliant. She lost her, both her parents. Uh, her mother died and her father left um, when she was very young and was raised by an aunt and was uh, very much used to uh, moving around and not really having any roots. So this is someone with a very strong character and very uh, well-balanced person to have handled that, a single woman in that time. Uh, we learn as the story goes, al goes along that she's had some tragedy in her life and some uh, difficulties. Uh, she's been victimized uh, at a, as a young girl, but she doesn't play a victim. She doesn't, you know, she's, she's, she's very resilient. So it's a wonderfully complex, interesting person to portray on, on stage. So that, that's always exciting. see her grow and change before you um, as life's circumstances affect her and as she meets these people, the Lattimores and uh, the, the Rucker Lattimore and his two daughters and that whole family and you really see a, a beautiful person emerge and learn about not only how she grows and changes but how she affects the others around her. Rucker's kind of an ornery guy. Uh, he's been going along with his life, and I think he settled for a while. I think he loved Maddie Lou, and I think that he was happy with where he was. I mean, if anybody can be happy. But I think he knew that this isn't exactly everything he wanted. And we, we settle for things. When we're in a position already, this is where he was. And he wasn't getting, it wasn't going to happen. Something already was at the top of the food chain. 
and it wasn't what he wanted. He, he, he knew he was missing out on something, but wasn't there. To go out and go get it, what good is that? Look at all the lives you'd, you'd disrupt. And he was an honorable man. Uh, uh, but when Love Simpson came into his life, uh, his soul knew it before his mind did. I'm gonna get married again. The only marriage is what I mean. A business link with the heart say. Keep out, cook, and wash clothes. I think he loved it very deeply and he was very concerned about people and he wanted the best for them and he was going to challenge them on any level he saw fit so that they would stand up for themselves and I think that's who he basically was and then he gets affected by love and I think that he turns into the man he always wanted to be one of these people that's able to embrace what's going on around him and, and really be much more positive and and, that, and those are the things that Maddie Lou I'm sure brought out the best she could in, in him but those are the things that a special relationship bring, brings out those qualities in, in each of those two people and I think that that's what happened to Rucker so we see him change from this kind of ornery guy this kind of guy that everybody all the little kids would be a little scared of you know little, yeah, that kind of thing. They kind of see him coming, you walk on the other side of the street and hope he doesn't talk to you, you know. But if he called you over, you'd come running right away and stand still and shake, you know. He's that kind of guy. But uh, to this guy that's got the twinkle in his eye and kind of likes to fool with people a little bit and have a good time and isn't afraid to, to, to do the, the silly things to, anymore to, to denote his affections or feelings for someone. No, Miss Love, you stay here. I'll be right back. How was your shopping trip, Miss Love? Oh, Will, I found such beautiful things. You'll drive me to the poorhouse yet. <laughs> In your plumbing and running water, no more trips down to Egypt. He's just perfect, and he's a generous, wonderful artist with whom to work. Um, I would say pretty much the same about um, John McVeigh, who is, once again, just perfect for the part. He's just, I mean, he looks the part. He's able to pull off the, you know, the 16-year-old Will Tweedy versus the 25-year-old Will Tweedy. And, and vocally, it's very, it's so suitable for him. Well, as you can tell, cold, sassy tree is not a tree at all. But in North Georgia town, where I was born, raised, and grew up, the town got its name from the first folks to settle here. They used to be a grove of sassafras trees as a sign of strong fall. They claimed that this was the coldest spot in all of Georgia since they was greeted by a blizzard in April. Switching back and forth between 15 and 25 years old, um, originally when I, when I first did the production was a real challenge. Um, because the, the two characters run in a parallel the, the whole time. The 25-year-old narrates the story, and then all of a sudden, changing your hat, literally, you're 15. And I didn't know exactly how to, how to make that change happen. Um, I, you know, I asked the director, and I said, what do I, you know, what do, I do? I mean, there are certain physicalities I can, I can do. I said, is there any way that we have you know, time for a makeup change? And he says, no, it's ridiculous, we can't do that. So to, to find a color in my voice to find um, a color in my posture how how the the old Will Tweedy would walk and carry himself a time of such wonder when pleasures were keenest Young Will Tweedy would have his hands in his pockets. He would be a little bit more awkward. He would, uh, he always holds his cap. If I didn't have my cap, I wouldn't be able to be the young Will Tweedy at 15. And I, I kid with everyone, I said, give me my hat. I said, I'm not doing the scene without my hat. I couldn't do it. I have built into the character, young Will Tweedy has this cap and it's his, it's his security. 
and it's what makes him youthful. And it makes him awkward. When you're 15, you're looking for people for approval on, on every level. And um, Will especially looks to love, you know, for that approval, almost that, that puppy love um, kind, of, kind of relationship. And after um, the final scene with Rucker, I put the cap on his, on his, uh, on the chaise, and I say goodbye to the young Will. And I don't think anyone even notices that. But that's, and then he, he stands up, and he says to his Aunt Loma and his, his mother, now I've got something to say, and I'm only going to say it but once. The same thing Rucker says when he comes in and he announces he's marrying Miss Love. And so he, he then becomes the old Will. There's one more thing. The, the most emotional and the, and the most rewarding spot is sitting uh, in, in the living room when, when Rucker is dying and having the conversation with him. And, you know, he says to me, um, they all complain I'm, I'm much too partial to you, but I don't see it that way at all. I'm just glad that I had you to dote on, that I was given a fine grand boy to love. And I just, I sing. And Rucker, in his costumes and his wigs and his makeup, look exactly like my grandfather did before he died. If you can allow yourself to be vulnerable enough to go back to certain places in your own personal life and put it up on stage for 3,000 people to see, it can be pretty moving. You remember what I told you Music is so, so, and this is the, it sounds so banal to say it, but it's such a potent force. Mm -hmm. And it's immediate when you're talking about musical characterization. We're not talking about a paragraph. We're talking about something that can occur in four measures. And you have the essence of a character. I mean, that's, that's what you have to dedicate yourself to as a musical dramatist. Coming up with a material that nails the moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, or the character. And that's something that composers have, if they're theater composers, I think have to address very early on in career, realizing what this enormously potent force is mm -hmm. and how careful they have to be with it and how precise they have to be. Yeah. That's, why, uh, that's why Verdi and Mozart are such marvelous musical dramatists, because they go right to the essence of the character or the essence of the dramatic situation. You know, Verdi was always saying to his librettist, what's the color of the scene? La tinta. Mm -hmm. La tinta. Yeah, right. the, the one color, and that's one word. I, I work with young composers that way. Mm -hmm. Don't give me 25 or 30 words. I want one word, because that then opens the computer for how will, how will that then project, be projected in rhythm, harmony, melody, all of those things, mm. pacing. Let us begin. <coughs> Orchestral writing is not just supportive and accompanimental to the um, uh, characters on stage, but they, they have writing which is very characteristic. In other words, the instruments have character. Uh, of course, that's my challenge and their challenge as musicians is to bring those characters out in the playing of their various materials. Well, I've heard a bunch of stories. I wanted to work very closely on the premiere of uh, Cold Sassy Tree in Houston. However, the entire rehearsal period coincided with the entire rehearsal period here in San Diego of A Streetcar Named Desire. Um, so I was really crestfallen. And I remember when I called Carlisle and told him, and I was almost in tears, not of, of anything except just frustration, <clears throat> that I couldn't be around that piece 
as it evolved and became the premiere it was in Houston in the spring. I did, however, make it to a performance uh, in May, early May, um, during the Opera America conference, May of 2000, and of course talked to Carlisle at length then. Um, but I followed it as closely as I could, juggling both of the things. Um, and I've, I've spent a lot of time, of course, with the score and since he's been here with him. And we've had a number of telephone conversations prior to this also. So I feel close to it and close to him. And Carlisle, I think by nature, is a very serious man and he's drawn to serious topics and subjects and treats them exceedingly well with great depth of feeling and with great scope. He was totally attracted by the subject matter and the book Cold Sassy Tree. The warmth and the humanity of the characters and the uh, realness of the characters and, and in his music in Cold Sassy Tree we see this reflected totally. It, it has a lightness of spirit and heart, and I'm speaking musically, of course, as well as subject matter. It's very melodic. It's very uh, jaunty at times. It's quite approachable, I think, for an audience. It, it, it's, it's seductive in its um, humor. Many of the operas we watch today, which we all love, have got in fact terrible librettos. If you sat down and read the storyline, you'd gag. I mean, they're, they're ghastly. They're essentially Victorian melodramas, which have survived because of the incredible beauty of the music. But uh, a lot of 20th century opera, and I think especially composers like Carlisle Floyd, who I think is absolutely fantastic, do pay as much attention to the librettos as they do to the music. So I think with a lot of those composers like Jana Czech or Britton or Strauss or, or Carla Floyd, the, the stories and characterizations are very, very strong and very modern and I think very appealing to a modern audience. You don't watch them and think, well, this is a, a bit of, you know, tribe, but the music's nice. You sit there and you think this is an involving, powerful story and the music's nice. <laughs> 